Welcome back. Ted Kinsman is a much respected Brighton High School physics teacher by day and a world-class time-lapse photographer by night. We spent some time with Ted who talked a little bit about his passion for teaching and his passion for photography. We're sure you'll agree that Ted's work has left a lasting impression here in Brighton and across the country. I'm Ted Kinsman. I live in Brighton. Uh, I teach physics at the Brighton High School and I'm also a writer, a cinematographer, and uh, a teacher. I started out by studying optics at MCC and uh, was introduced to a lot of the different types of film and video and optical techniques. And uh, later on I started doing some writing for some science magazines and found out that the, uh, the photography paid as much if not more than the writing. So I started to think more about uh, science photography and how I could acquire images that would be valuable. And so I decided to concentrate on time lapse and started building my own uh, camera systems and computer systems uh, to take time lapse all the time, even when I was teaching at Brighton. A lot of times I'll try to incorporate some form of physics into uh, the photography or I'll see something really interesting in physics and I realize that it's not uh, something that other photographers would know how to film. And a particular example of that is the, is the soap film uh, sequences that I've recently shot. And that was all uh, soap sustained to a two dimensions in a um, between two pieces of monofilament fishing line and the soap falls at its terminal velocity but yet it's lit with a white light that shows the optical interference patterns and all those different colors display the motions of the of the fluid as it's flowing which are just tremendous and, and quite uh, quite visually exciting probably one of the most interesting projects I've worked with in the last year is uh, the thermal imagery process where a new camera had just come on the market that was um, uh, it shoots or it does digital in the 8 to 10 micron regions which means it can show thermal heat and up to uh, 2003 this camera had pretty much been secured by the military so this this technology was just licensed for civilian use and I was able to write a grant and get uh, one of these cameras for one week. When shooting time-lapse in uh, the time-lapse plants, it all has to be computer controlled. And a lot of people think it's done outside. Well, it's all done in a lab. And everything is controlled by a microprocessor or a computer. And that includes the lights, which are sequenced on and off, the camera, which is, uh, uh, takes a picture, and then the picture is downloaded from the camera to a computer. Uh, even the heating pads under the flowers are controlled by a computer. And so there's a lot of different interactions that take place and it all has to be very finely controlled. I set up a, a high speed system in my basement for starting to uh, look at sequential repeatable events. And that's a, a droplet of water uh, that comes down in front of a flower I can trigger the flashes at the exact same time when the droplet gets to the exact same place in space. And that's what the drip series is all about. It's uh, catching these, these little drips in space as the, the flower undergoes time-lapse motion in the background, which in the real world you can't, com you can't put together time-lapse and high speed, but you can in these special effects. If there's, if there's one shot, which I consider the, the perfect time-lapse shot that I've, that I've taken over the last 10 years, um, it's probably one I was, I was working on a commission and uh, one of my neighbors came by with this, uh, this stem of lilies and I just put it in the time-lapse rig and, and shot it. And uh, all these flowers just sequenced, opened all together one morning and the, the timing was just perfect. And after you do a shot like that, it's like, you know, I don't know if I'll ever get another great shot like that again. This one particular stockhouse has, has a reputation for having some of the best microscopy in the world. So the owner of the stockhouse requested that I take uh, some very specialized pictures, one of which was blood going through veins. And this is a, a very difficult shot to do. If you, there's a couple of ways of doing it. You can dissect frogs. You can uh, look at different types of mammals that are um, put under anesthetic. Um, but the easiest way to do it is to photograph a goldfish tail. 
You don't have to hurt the goldfish at all. And you can see the, the blood flowing through the veins. And this is the technique that I use to collect these, these images of, of blood moving through veins. And it's, it's a, quite a popular shot for medical imagery, uh, for doctors or for hospitals. And it's, it's quite, quite often used. And then it, it kind of uh, dawned on me that one of the things that is so neat about microscopy and fairly difficult to do and hasn't been done in about a hundred years was snowflakes. So I started looking at different ways of photographing snowflakes and building better and better systems. And it really took me about eight years to build better systems for taking pictures of snowflakes and working on the lightings, lens combinations, and hooking them up with digital cameras before I think I really got it right. And um, in the recent years, I've taken several thousand uh, very good images of, of snowflakes, and those are finding their homes in chemistry textbooks and uh, greeting cards, and uh, one even uh, won the Nikon Awards this past uh, fall in uh, 2003. I do tie in uh, the photography to my students, and I, I typically have a picture of, of one of the last things I worked on on the wall. I also like to show them some of the, the high-speed shots that I work on, and they think that's, that's pretty cool. And I've had some kids that uh, they came up to me, and they, they went to my internet site, and then they came up to me and they said, uh, oh, that, that science stuff is so cool. How do you do that? And it's these, these kids that really don't have very much interest in science, but they like this imagery and it kind of pulls them in and they want to learn a little bit more about science. When I was down at the, the Nikon Awards, um, one of the things was uh, bringing, you know, educating people about science and using science photography as an avenue uh, of education. I think that's a really a big idea, probably a, sort of a theme throughout my life, using images either to, to bring people to science or to, to help people understand science. Because a lot of times people will, will hear about something and, and they'll just, uh, they won't necessarily think about it or, or uh, get involved in that topic. But if they see a really colorful image uh, of something, that, then they'll stop and they'll, they'll think about it. Or, or it'll bring young kids into, into science because there are these really cool images associated with something. And, and how does that work? You know, How do these images uh, uh, help people out? And, um, it's, it's a neat way of educating people bringing people into the sciences or making science accessible to the average person. Um, as far as bringing science into the art world, that's anybody's guess. But uh, some of the images are quite striking and, and spectacular and, uh, and very unique in their own right. Um, are they art? I'll leave that up to the artist. To me, it's just cool science.